Hello, Terry. Hello. Now, before we talk about Discworld, give me a definition of fantasy as you see it. Well, nearly all fiction is fantasy. Uh, detective stories are fantasy. Westerns are fantasy. Um, probably people think that fantasy just means wizards and, and, and guys with big muscles and, and long swords. And um, I was reading one of those books one day and I thought, this is, this is not real. Let's try and make fantasy real. Let, let's say, what's it like to be Conan the Barbarian when you're 89? You know, it's a bit uncomfortable with the hemorrhoid ring on the saddle. You know. Your back keeps giving away at the vital moment. And I thought, there are so many cliches in the, in the fairy tale view of fantasy, of the wizards and the witches and so forth, that it may be fun just to treat them as if they were real life. Now, I don't know whether that's a definition or not, but that's where I work. Well, it's certainly a departure, say, from the books of Tolkien, which are fantasy, but it has to be said, Tolkien's not exactly a barrel of laughs, is he? No, and, and uh, Tolkien was, was great, but there, there were lots of people who have copied Tolkien, and, and they, they've not really done fantasy much of a service. I mean, no one in their right mind ever said, ho, landlord, a pint of your finest ale, and not unless they were on <laughs> serious medication. Um, and there were so many outrageous things done in the name of fantasy, so, so many silly films that I thought, you know, it's time to have a laugh at it. Oh. Now, Discworld, where does that fit into the, the thing, theme of fantasy? Because I understand you've written 12, what, nearly 12 novels? 13 now. 13. And there'll be another one along in a minute. So is Discworld uh, an idea, a concept that's infinitely expandable? I just, wanted a, I just wanted a fantasy world. And it took me all of about five seconds to remember Discworld which I didn't exactly invent. Uh, it's an old myth, the idea that the world goes through space on the back of a giant turtle. And one particular subset of that myth put four elephants on the top. I don't know why, maybe they thought it was ridiculous just to have the turtle there. You needed the four elephants in the corners. Of course. And I remembered it from an old book on astronomy and um, that was it. I, I stole it and ran away before the alarms went off. And I mean, I'm just wondering what the average reader makes of this. I mean, who is your average reader? Well, I wish I knew. Uh, the youngest fan letter I've got, if you understand what I mean, was from a girl aged seven. And the oldest one was from uh, an 85-year-old academic in Oxford, and they were both about the same book. And I see my readers when I do signing tours, and it's very odd because, you know, you've got a seven-year-old girl, and then Noza, Roza, Bazza and Skaz, all about 14. The and, heavy you know, metal fans, with the, yeah. yeah. And the long hair, and they all, wear about, they all weigh about seven stones soaking wet. And then there's their mum behind them with her books. And there's, an, there's another ten-year-old. And then there's an old white-haired guy with a carrier bag full of the things. So I think it's everyone that really enjoys reading. Do you feel, though, because there are lots of young people, that you have a special responsibility to kind of knock out all the bits of sex and violence? Well, there's a, there's a certain amount of violence, um, tastefully done, of course. Of course. Uh, people keep saying that there's no sex in the books, which is kind of weird. I mean, I bet they didn't say, you know, hey, Mr. You know, Mr. Dickens, why is there no sex in Pickwick Papers? You know? <laughs> um, sex is clearly somewhere in the background, but, but generally my characters have got other things on their mind, like, like survival. Uh, no, I, I know a lot of children as well as adults read the books. And one of the, the best things you can do for children is help them grow up to be good adults. Um, so I don't particularly go out of my way to, to, to censor what I do. It just comes naturally. Were you a bookish child? Did you always have your nose in a book? Not originally, because I had an absolutely idyllic childhood. You know, trees, fields, uh, gang, did. running around. Yeah. Tell me a bit about that, because everybody's looking for successful authors to have a really unhappy childhood. You know, I know, it's really distressing. You know, I had no <laughs> hang-ups. I had to invent them all myself. I wasn't forced to go to church or hit or anything. Um, I remember my childhood as one long summer. And, it, it, and I, I think we were the last generation you know, in the 50s to have that kind of childhood where your mum could more or less let you go anywhere. Although, come to think of it, I don't think we were ever more than a quarter of a mile from someone's home. But for us, we had a whole landscape to play in. And books never really featured much in my life till I was about nine or ten, and someone gave me a copy of The Wind in the Willows. And no one had told me that books were like this. You know, I, um, in fact, we were coming back from London in my, my dad's old car, and I was reading the book by the light of the streetlights. Half a sentence as every streetlight went past, and you could put your finger on it until the next one. And I was 
instantly hooked. I just had not realised that books could, books could be fun. I mean, I read The Dandy Annual and Janet and John and things like that. But I went from a kid to whom reading was something you did if there was nothing else to do to a 40-book-a-day man. And what do you read now? <laughs> Absolutely everything. I mean, that, that's, that's part of my job, I think. You, know, you, have to, you have to keep yourself informed on all kinds of weird things to import them into what you do. What I liked about the books when I was reading them was that there's this lovely racy journalistic feel to them. It's almost like a newspaper feature in certain things. <laughs> now, I know you worked as a journalist. Uh, is that something you're very conscious about, it's this style? It's probably the secret of my success. Um, when you work on a newspaper, you're taught that there is no such thing as writer's block because unsympathetic men come and shout at you if you say you can't do it. So that gets burned out of you in about a fortnight, and you're also told that you have to produce, that there are pages of newspaper and they must be filled up. So when I started writing fiction, I, I looked upon it in the same kind of way, you know, day one, you know, hour one, let's sit down and start work. And um, I don't sort of agonise too much about the condition of the writer's soul. Well, I get that over first thing in the morning and then the rest of the day I can do for work. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a matter of getting on with it, I suppose, and, and I've got on with it enough to, to be successful. You're probably Britain's least famous, best-selling author. Oh, there's no glitz. You know, I haven't got such good hair as Barbara Taylor Bradford, and my <laughs> shirt doesn't come off the shoulder like Jilly Cooper's dress, and I haven't got a sequin to my name. Does that bother you? No, not really. I think authors should be invisible. That nice Mr Wogan never invited me to tea, you know. Um, it's like being a big conspiracy. There's, there's millions of people out there that read the books, and there's me, and I write the books for them, and they read the books, and they pay the publishers money, and some of it comes back to me, and we're all kind of in on the conspiracy, and no one else knows about it. Uh, I'm quite happy with that. I, I feel at home in front of a keyboard. Uh, in front of a camera, no. <laughs> well, just one more question. I'm just wondering, where do you get your ideas from? They're around all the time. Uh, they really are. It's just that you have to kind of slow down enough to notice them. There, there's nothing special uh, about me. Um, anyone could, could have ideas. I, I just maybe have the, a certain amount of insight to assemble them in a certain way, and I put them on the page. Oh, Terry Pratchett, modesty becomes you. Well, good luck with the, 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 the next book. Is that a Discworld novel? The next one's a book, allegedly, for children. No doubt all the adults will go out and buy it like they did the last one, but that's coming out in September. And you wouldn't be complaining about that now, would you? No. <laughs> Terry Pratchett, thank you for being with us. Thank you.